Exodus chapter 20. We're in a series on the Ten Commandments. Jesus has explained to us what the heart of the, though we are not under the law, we are under grace by the blood of Christ today. The heart of the law was encompassed in what Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. When we do that, we live as Christ followers, as a regenerate life, changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, made a new creation, ought to live. The Ten Commandments gives us a picture, some instruction as to what, in a general sense, that looks like when Christ is Lord of our life. To honor God and to respect and love each other. A few years ago, I don't know how many anymore, because I lose track with kids being born and years go. People told me a long time ago, the older you get, years go by faster. Man, is that true. So I used to say two years ago, three years ago. Now I'm one of those people that just says years ago. <laughs> I don't know what realm or uh, demographic that's entering me into, but I feel it happening and it's scary to me. But anyway, years ago, uh, I m remember waking up one morning and I was getting dressed and coming down the steps to leave in my house. At that time, we had a couple kids, I guess, and uh, they would get up, as is their habit when they're younger, earlier than you do in the house. And they would, you know, mill around the house and do things. And every now and then something would crash onto the floor and we'd have to go figure out what's going on. And uh, so that would happen, which was a very normal scenario. So I, I, would, I was coming down the steps. And as I was coming down the steps, I heard a clattering sound, I guess, of uh, something going on in the house. I thought, oh, you know, the kids are up, they're doing something, they just tip something over. So I said, thinking it was my son, my oldest boy, I said, son, it was a question, and nobody answered me, and I heard these footsteps and a, a ruckus and a door slamming, and I thought, he just, he just ran outside, this is what we're doing now? He just I, I call you, you run outside? And as I came down the steps in the house I lived in at that time, you came into like a living room area, and I surveyed the room, and I realized, just naturally just look around, and, and things were out of order. A drawer, a drawer was open, multiple drawers, stuff was on the floor, cabinets were, had been opened in the kitchen, and my wife, her purse in the kitchen was dumped upside down and emptied and thrown like off to the side, and the door to the house was open. And I hope you never have to have this happen. I really do. But if you have had anything like this happen, you know what I'm saying when I say this is a horrifying reality that rushes in on you like a wave of shock and awe. Because you realize it was not my kids up. There was the noise I just heard was someone in my house that took my stuff and left the house in a rush. And you realize, your mind just grinds gears and shifts into a different reality, and you think, I can't believe this has happened and is happening live right in front of me. I open the kitchen door to the outside and cautiously look around. There's stuff spilled in the yard, and I, I go outside, and I kind of slowly walk around the house, and there's no one to be found. Whoever it was is gone. I realize I'd been robbed so when came in my house and I was home and I'd been robbed, the violation of that, the disrespect of that, the, just the, the shock and the things that come into your mind, I, I could not believe it. That they came into my house and they stole from me with my children home, my wife and I home, knowing we were home, kids' toys in the yard, cars parked in the driveway. You came in and you stole from me. And you're appalled by that. You know, you're, 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 you're angry, you're... You just can't believe that someone would cross that line. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 15, God, as the eighth commandment, states so clearly and concisely to his people, you shall not steal. 
And in the Ten Commandment law, what that means is what I just described. You don't go and take something from somebody else. He said, if you're going to be people that follow after me, you don't steal from one another. You don't go in and take their stuff for yourself in an unlawful, ungodly way. And so right now what we have here this morning is people thinking in their head probably, this one, I finally found one, and it's not going to get me this time. Because I don't, I, man, Pastor West, man, I can't believe they did that to your house. I, I wish I'd have been there. Remember the do not murder one. <laughs> I had to go back there that day. But I don't steal. Like that's, that's what, Some of them, you know, I get it, and, and we don't realize. This one, this one's a no-brainer. You think that. I, I don't steal. Okay. Me either. That's what God said. Don't steal from people, their money, their stuff, their things. Before we go any further and wade into this chest high, let's find a thief in the Bible, okay? Let's talk about a thief by name. And the reason is just so you can feel the weight of the kind of character a thief has. Just so you can see what kind of people are thieves. What's in their soul? What's in their heart? Let's find a thief. And let's look at him very closely for a second. And then ask ourselves, have the courage to ask ourselves, Lord, is there any way in my life I'm like him? Ready? John chapter 12. Verse 4. But Judas Iscariot, that's a heavy name in the world, one of his, Jesus' disciples, who was intending to betray him, said, verse 5, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, what he's asking before we go any further, it seems like a noble question because what's happened is a lady has come and taken an expensive perfume that costs a lot of money, could be sold and, and, and get a lot of money by the sale of it and be used to give to the poor. Well, yeah, that's a good thing to do. And Judas knew, as we know, that's even part of what Jesus said we are to do. So what happened is she came and she took this expensive perfume and she poured it out on Jesus' feet. She anointed Jesus with this perfume as an offering of worship to him. And Judas asked the question, which seems like the right question, wait a minute, why would we pour that out? I mean, can't we pay honor a different way? We could have sold that and we could have had a lot of money to give to the poor. Now, sure, verse 6. Now he, Judas, said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. That is the manipulative question of a lying thief. Because thieves are liars too. You have to be. And what he said was, why don't we sell it and we could get the money and give it to the poor because then he would have the money in the money box and he wanted that money and his greed would allow him to take that money. He would pilfer in that money box because he's a thief. The one who sold out also for greed for 30 pieces of silver, the identity and location of Jesus that ushered in his murder, Judas Iscariot is a thief. When people are thieves, they are like him. That's who we are like. That's what thieves look like. That's what people that steal act like. And it can start small and it grows like a cancer inside of you and infects who you are and pollutes your very character and your soul. Judas was a thief. But... At the same time, watch this, at the same time professed to be one of the rest of the guys that followed Jesus. He's one of the 12 disciples. Jesus picked them. Like many people today that are thieves, 
At the same time, given the right setting and uh, environment or company, they will act like they are followers of Christ. Well, at the same time, just like Judas, acting like he was a follower of Christ with noble questions like, shouldn't we be doing more for the poor? People will act Christ-like while at the same time stealing from one another. The Bible says about Judas, John chapter 6, verse 70, Jesus said this, Jesus answered them, did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Judas was a devil. He was not a Christ follower that stumbled, that struggled, that had a bad day. He was a devil from the beginning. And Jesus knew it. And he said, I picked you, the 12, and one of you here today is a devil, he was saying. Stealing is of the devil in every form. And when he stole, when he was a thief, when he was a liar, he was doing the works of his true father, the devil. Isn't that something? I don't know how many times I've said it. If you never studied Judas, do it. Fascinating to behold. This guy, you know the story of the 5,000, right? 5,000 hungry people, no food, little boy, five loaves, two fish, that's all I got. Disciples, we don't have enough food or money to buy anything. Send them home, buy food for themselves, let's get out of here. Jesus says, sit them down, you're going to feed them. He gets this kid's basket. You know the story, 5,000 plus women and children, everybody eats. And when it's over, it says the 12 disciples were told by Jesus, go pick up the leftovers. They picked up 12 baskets, 12, one for each disciple. So Judas was there. Judas picked up the basket, literally put his hands on the miracle that Jesus had just performed. He saw it live. Judas. He saw Jesus speak, peace be still to a storm, and the wind and the waves obey him. He saw it. First eyewitness. Demonic power driven out. Dead people raised. Blind people saw. Lame men walked. Judas saw it. Touched it. But he wasn't one of them. He was a devil and a thief. People get so close to the glory of God. So close, they can feel it. Right in here today, you can feel the worship. You can feel people speaking and praising God from the core. That in Christ alone, I find my strength. My sin is nailed to the cross in Jesus. And people, out of the fact that they have been redeemed and saved, made a new creation, praise the Lord, and power fills the room. People feel that. People see that. People profess to be a part of that, get so close to that, they can touch it. But it's not in them. Devils. Judas. And he was a thief. I remember um, thinking in my life that as a believer, as a Christ follower, well, I'm not a thief, man. I, I don't believe you should steal, don't leave personal property, all this stuff. Leave it alone. And in college, I, I remember it, it shook me. I don't know if that was the first time, probably not. Uh, but it, uh, I remember being rattled about something, and, and I didn't see it. Because what's the Bible say about Satan? He's crafty. Like, are, are we going to break into each other's homes and take each other's stuff? Probably not. Probably not. Like, oh, I'm, I'm not that guy. I got broken your house. No way, man. Thieves, wrong. Judas, wrong. That's not me. But Satan's crafty. He, 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 he'll offer it to you in a different package. And you don't recognize it's the same thing. Remember, um, oh, what do you say? This is going to be a certain generational demographic here, but I'll do the best I can. Napster. Does that mean anything to anybody in this room? Napster, yeah, head shaking, yes. So everybody over 30 just was like, oh, Napster. <laughs> Napster, the music download website. When I was a freshman in college, which was 1997, sometime around there, a little later, I came across for the very first time Napster music. Like, 
Somebody told me, you know, this was back in the day when you first were able to burn a CD. Dude, that guy's got a burner. <laughs> a burner? Like an oven? No, oh, man, you could, you could do your own stuff. Like a real CD? Hey, oh, we were amazed in college. You know, I had to get a burner. Then you get a computer with a, it's a hard drive and a burner. No, uh <laughs> No, you could, no, that blew my mind, you know. And somebody said, hey, you know that you can go on this thing called Napster and you can download anything, any music in the world. Like, you can? Yeah. And, uh, well, how do you do that? What do you got to pay? Well, it's free. Really? So I did it. I just, crafty, right? I did it. I'm like, oh, I like these songs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to burn a CD, you know? So I went out, and, and you could download from Napster any artist, any song, and you, it would keep it on a file on your computer. You download 10, 12 songs. You burn it to a CD, and you listen to it in your car as if you bought a custom CD at the store, but you didn't pay a dime for it. And you burned it, and it was yours. And I don't remember who or when, but around that time, iTunes came out, and they were selling songs for a dollar. I thought, a dollar? Who's going to do that? <laughs> Pay a dollar? I got Napster. I'm sorry. This is, listen, I, one thing I promise you, I'm not going to lie to you. I, 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 I stole. Went to the Lord. He nails it to the cross. And I said, a dollar? Why would you do iTunes? Who are those guys think they are? And somebody said, Maybe it was one of my brothers on the hall in the dorm. I don't remember. It was a devotional or something. Somebody said, you know, you guys using Napster, you're, you're stealing. We were like, what? Didn't even see it. Crafty. What do you mean we're stealing? It's a, those guys are not, they're giving away copyrighted music that was not licensed and they had a right to license that, the artist, for profit. That's their business, their livelihood. They have every right to do that. And they're taking it, and you are participating in theft. And it shook me. I, I thought, I'm a thief? I can't stand thieves. All of a sudden, I was one. I started paying a dollar. I did. And people made fun of me. Welcome to the club, somebody just said. I'm glad I'm not alone. I'm glad I'm not alone. But I thought, I, I've got people, why are you doing that? And, and then I started saying it, not because I'm self-righteous. I started saying, because I think it's stealing, man. You guys are stealing. I, I don't want to steal. God says don't steal. We say we know God. I don't want to be like Judas. I know him, but I'm a thief. Gets there quick, doesn't it? Oh, I didn't, I'm glad I didn't do any of that. No, but we pass our Netflix password out to everybody we know. Same thing. It's the same thing. Now I wonder how many thieves are in the house now. <laughs> Just like that. He's crafty. Judas was a thief. Thieves are like him. Stealing is of the devil in every form. You're not a thief, are you? You're going to report all that cash on your taxes? Because a thief doesn't. Some men, their garages are filled with excellent tools that have been stolen over the years from their company, and they told themselves some sort of justification as to why it was okay. Judas would have done that too. Companies pay several of us here in some ways under the trust factor to work a certain amount of hours at a job, trusting that you're there. They give you a check, and it's the same amount no matter what. They, we're paying you this. You work here. Here's what you get paid. This is our money given to you for these agreed-upon services rendered. And not every company has a punch in and punch out. It gets less all the time. We, we live in a very flex schedule culture, and that's not going back. A lot of working from home. A lot of uh, in-between sites. A lot of travel. A lot of business expenses. Company credit cards. These kind of things. A lot of that stuff happens. That's just the world we live in. And that's fine. 
The question is, is what they have agreed to pay you for, are you doing? Or do you think you've got the best deal in the world because like a thief like Judas, as long as we can portray one thing, who's going to know? Who's going to know? Who's going to know when I show up? Who's going to know when I leave? Who's going to know? If I get it all done here, who's going to really know? Who's going to know if I take this? How are they going to? They, they're never going to feel. They're this big company, this big corporate. How are they going to know? Well, they might not. But the God who said do not steal, he knows. The same God you claim to follow like Judas claimed to follow. I've, I've been told in my life because it came out in a company that I was a Christian, maybe because I didn't swear or whatever, whoever, whoever the reasons are, you, you guys that are uh, Christians and try to be real ones, uh, get found out eventually, right? People know there's something different. Who Are you, are you like uh, religious or something? You know, it, it comes out. I remember a boss told me, will you go and do this thing at this job site for us? We, 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 we want you to do it. I don't remember a lot of the details. And I said, yeah, but isn't it this guy's job? Uh, it's not that I'm saying I wouldn't, but is he still work here? So yes, he does, but we know that you're a Christian and we trust you to make sure it gets done. Now, he didn't claim to know the Lord, but what is he saying? What is he saying? Even if he doesn't realize he's saying, what is he saying from his gut? You claim to know God. We don't know who God is. I don't know if I follow him, this guy maybe, but we, we see that you believe and you follow, and we know that people follow. We know that this God you believe in says, don't steal. Somewhere in him, he understood that, that if you follow him, you must not be a thief. Now, when people think that, which they have a right to think, are they right? He believed that I would act differently because of who I claimed my Lord was and his assumption should be right because Christ followers don't steal. The Bible says in Psalm 37, 21, stealing, different forms, different packages. The wicked borrows and does not pay back. Oh, man. I think this is a commandment It's not going to get me. The wicked borrows and doesn't pay back. They borrow things. They borrow money. They don't, I can't, pay, I can't pay it back. You know all the things I've done for him anyway? And you work out a deal in your head that doesn't exist. You know who does that? Wicked people. Not Christ followers. Wicked people. They borrow and they don't pay it back or they bring it back broken or they bring it back out of gas or they bring it back you know, less than it was. My dad always said, and my dad's not the word of God, but uh, the way he would say things sometimes in my life, it, it seemed close. <laughs> my dad always said, you don't bring it back how you found it, you bring it back better. I still try to live by that. I don't know if I get it right all the time, I still try to do it. And our, our staff and those that work here, we say that all the time. You don't, you, don't bring it, you don't bring it back how you found it. Find a way to bring it back better. I remember when, we were, when I was a kid, I don't remember when, but I've heard it so many times, it's etched in my brain like on, on a stone of tablet. I was a kid and we were borrowing a, a truck or a boat or something and my dad filled it up with gas and washed it before we returned it. Put everything back in order and uh, I said, uh, why'd you do that, Dad? Why did we fill it up? See, my dad didn't believe that if it was half tank, you bring it back with a half tank. Some people believe that, and if that's what you believe, I'm not here to tell you because I don't have a verse. All I have is wicked borrows and does not pay back. But my dad said, you don't bring it back. You, 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 you bring it back better because you borrowed it, and that even is worth something more. So don't bring it back with a half tank. Bring it back with a full tank. So we, I said, why'd you do that, dad? And my dad, I'll never forget it. He would say it all the time, still says it today. He's like, because people that bring it back empty are losers, son. And we're not losers. I was like, okay. You don't want to be a loser, do you? No, Dad, I don't. Don't be a loser. Don't be wicked. Don't borrow and don't pay back. Don't bring it back damaged. There's a story in the Bible, and I've wondered, I, though I've always liked it because it's an interesting story, sometimes you come across things in the Bible and you ever wonder, like, why did God put that in there? 
Like just a little parenthetical story. Maybe there's a grand story of God doing something very clear and powerful, and then there's this little, oh, and then these two guys went over and did this and this happened. You're like, why, why would he put that in there? What is the point of that? I figured it out today. <laughs> I've, I've always loved it. Some of you Bible students will, will recognize it. The rest of you will learn a lesson I'm borrowing, I guess, because I think it matters to God because it's in the Scripture in several spots. And to borrow poorly or not pay back is stealing. There are these guys in the Bible, one of them you might recognize by the name of Elisha the prophet, not Elijah, the second one, Elisha the prophet, and he always traveled with this guy. Whenever you see Elisha, not whenever, but often, you see this guy traveling with him, this, this servant guy that was like an understudy of Elisha. <clears throat> and so they came to this thing and, and um, they had outgrown a, a, like a, like a worship-type facility, and, and uh, they were going to build a new temple and stuff, and uh, they had to go cut a bunch of trees down to do it. They said, this place has become too limited for us. We need to build a new one. Let's go down to the Jordan River and cut down trees with axes and build a new one and make boards and so forth. So that's what they did. So there's the story. That story makes sense. But in that story, there was a part where I always thought, that's strange. I think I know what it's about. So they're down there chopping, 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 4. So he, uh, the servant, and Elijah went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. Okay? So here we are. Still happens today. Hey, can I borrow your chainsaw? You know, that's not a, I'm not angry at anybody. But yeah, that happens, right? I borrow your chainsaw, borrow your axe, borrow your truck, borrow your car, borrow your tractor. Right? Do it all the time. You got to borrow stuff. So he goes down there and he borrows an axe and he starts cutting trees down. Verse 5, but as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he, the servant, cried out and said, Alas, my master, for it was borrowed. Now that's a guy working hard not to swear. <laughs> Sorry. Next time. Next time it happened. Alas! It was borrowed. The axe head falls into the water. Why is he upset? Not because it fell into the water, because it was borrowed and that mattered. It's a man of integrity. That's a man of godliness. That's a man of understanding that he walks with the reputation of his Lord stamped upon his life, upon his conduct, and this guy doesn't want to be a thief. Says to Elijah, Elisha, it was borrowed. What are we going to do? If it was mine, whatever. That's not mine. So how do we, what do we do? And God literally performs a miracle to bring it back. Verse 6, then the man of God said, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick, threw it in there, and made the iron float. He said, take it up for yourself. So he put out his hand and took it. That's the entire story right there. That's it. Now, maybe there's some wizardly Bible students that can find 10 layers of theology behind that. Here's what I get from it. Don't be a bad borrower. Even God, that counts with God. God made iron float one time, so those that represent him weren't losers. <laughs> weren't thieves. We don't steal from each other, but you know even bigger than that. Oh, man. That's a big deal. If you're stealing from people, it's a big deal. And it's wrong before the Lord. But there's a bigger one than that. Some people are stealing from God. That seems like a really big deal. Before we talk about that, let's just clear something up. Because here's the question we have to answer before we even talk about it. Well, how would I know that? Because first we have to know what? Someone's asking, what stuff belongs to God and what stuff belongs to me? Because if it's mine, I'm not stealing. I can do whatever I want with it. That's true. If it's his, I need to know which things are his and which things are mine. All right. Well, the Bible deals with that. I'm thankful for it because that'd be a confusing question, wouldn't it? Luckily, there's zero confusion. Psalm 24.1, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Oh, 
Well, there, there it is. You know what stuff is his? All of it. The earth. And all it contains. You know what else is his? You are. Those who dwell. Not forget your stuff. Your stuff was his a long time. You belong to him. Most importantly, those who are the blood-bought saints of the living God that he purchased with his own blood. You, your life, belongs to him and everything you have. So with that umbrella up as to what's what, it's all his, okay? All your money, let's just get uncomfortable. All your money, it's his money. Let me do the disclaimer just in case. Oh, here he goes. Here's a pastor. He's talking about money. He's going to use the Bible to guilt everybody. The church must have some financial struggle they got to deal with right now. That's not true in any way. No debt, not a dime of debt here, not a bill not paid, nothing. Sending money around the world, just so you know, not, not boasting either, just boasting in the Lord, just clearing myself, which is why I believe in no debt, because otherwise there'd be a cloud over this sermon right now, wouldn't there? But there isn't. So here we go. Your money that you think is your money is his money, all of it. Your stuff, the car you drove here, the home you will return to today, the wallet you will reach for and pay for lunch is his. All of it. The Bible says in Malachi chapter 3, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me but you say, how have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? <clears throat> Tithe, Old Testament term primarily, that means a tenth. And in the Bible there's other contexts that means a tenth of all your increase. Of all that you have, a tenth belongs to God. And does that mean more than money? Most certainly. Yes, it does. But it definitely means money, too. A tenth is the tithe. That goes to the Lord. And in the old days, in the Old Testament, that went to the temple and to the priests uh, for the service and the work of the ministry to the Lord. That's why we still, sometimes we call it tithing. We don't say that here because it's a little bit different context now, which I'll get to. But at this point, in the Old Testament, under the law, they were robbing God in, their, in the first tenth of all of their increase, which means they owed it to God because it was his, and he said, you get to keep 90 of what is mine, I'm just asking for the tenth. And they said, I'll take the nine dollars, slap you, and take the one. He said, well, you just robbed me. Offerings. Offerings are above and beyond that. They would support the work of the ministry, but today you might interpret that as something like this. You see a missionary going onto the field preaching the gospel. You see a family that lives next door or in this house that is in great need. You see a single mom that is struggling. You see someone with a car repair they can't afford, and then there goes the tithe, and then you feel the Lord prompt you, give them some of my money that you are a steward of, that you are a manager of, because it's mine, but I gave some to let you borrow and use. Give them some of that to fix their car, to help their life, to pay this bill, to lift this burden, to support that work. Offerings. Tithe offerings. Okay? They were robbing him. They weren't doing it. You're supposed to do it. When God calls you to do it, but they didn't do it, and they were robbing him. And people are robbing him today. People are still doing it. But let me tell you something, because I don't want to be a manipulative liar, because then I would be a thief. If you're like, oh, man, that's, we're robbing God. Did you know we were robbing God? I don't want to do it. Time to write out a check. Oh, it's what God wants. No, it isn't. In the New Testament, which is where we live, we're not under the law, but we're under grace. You know what the Bible says? Let me give you the whole story here. The Bible says the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Do not give under compulsion. So if the Old Testament law compels you to give out of guilt or great burden, you probably shouldn't do it because your, your money's useless. Your things are you. You're doing it with a heart 
that has a grudge against what God has asked you to do. And that's not what he wants. So the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Do not give under compulsion. A lot of people have used stuff like this about tithes and offerings to leverage guilt on a congregation, to soak money out of them from guilt. And I think they're thieves for doing that. But I'm not going to do that. But at the same time, it does say the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And if you don't give out of love, and if you can't give because you don't love to give and you're not cheerful, then that probably means that God isn't God and that money is God and you love it more than him. So, oh man. Right? Robbery. And, 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 and God doesn't need your money. Just, let's just clear that one up. Oh, the Lord needs, you know, he needs us to do that. No, he doesn't. Here's the thing. It's already his. If he wants it, he'll, he'll just come get it. He, he, come get it. I've said this before. Everything in my house that my kids have, that's mine. That little plastic drone they fly around, that's my drone. You have, you can have it. But if I need to come get it because there's a problem or there's something wrong with your heart and I need to chastise you, with this, I'll just come get it. You can't stop me. Yeah, that's mine. Guess not. My drone. This is my toy. This is my doll. <laughs> that's mine. Right? It's all mine. And it's all God's. Same thing. Even bigger. He can come in. You don't want to let him borrow your stuff, your car. You don't want to use your stuff when he calls you. Well, I don't really like lending my stuff out. Right. Well, it's his stuff, and he lends his stuff out all the time. Now, there's stewardship and responsibility and wisdom within that you need to seek the Lord about. But if you're one of those people, I have a general policy, I don't lend things out. Well, God has a general policy that he does, and it's his. And if he needs to come and get it or crash it to teach you a lesson, he will. <laughs> he will. There's a story in the Bible about our things. Our things, oh, our thing, my thing, my stuff. Story about a donkey. We had a story about an axe. Let's look at a donkey for a second, a colt. There's this uh, part where Jesus gives the instructions to some two guys, two disciples. They go into town. He says, go into town. And uh, he says in uh, Luke chapter 19 and verse 30, go into the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. Now, the world would say, well, that's not his colt. He's just, just going to go steal it? Can't steal from the Lord. It's all his. You know, for the Lord. It's it. Verse 31, Jesus said, knowing that they had this question. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. You know, the only requirement that is necessary for God to use your stuff or your money or any of your things is him to just have need of it. If he wants to, that's all he needs to say to us. I want you to use this for that. I want you to give me this in this way. No more questions because it's his. So he said, when they ask you, why are you taking my colt? Just say, the Lord has need of it. Now, I can't say that to you. I'm coming, hey, I need that truck. Why? Well, I have, Wes has need of it. <laughs> no. But he can because it's his. I can't because it's not mine. But that's all. I need it. Give it to me is what he's saying. So they go. So those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them, as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? Hello, ho, why are you taking the horse thing? <laughs> and they said, the Lord has need of it. No more conversation. Credit to the guy who had the colt. I don't know who that guy is. But here's the next verse. They brought it to Jesus. They threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. It's his. Isn't that interesting? You don't see the conversation there. I don't want to preach something that's not in the word of God, but it's almost like that guy was like, whoa, the Lord Jesus? Yeah, he, he, he has need of it. Well, it's his anyway. Take it. I thought you guys were taking it, but if, it, if he has need of it, Take it. Here's a question I have for you. Can Jesus call for your colt anytime? Has he already done it? Can he use your truck? Your home? I don't like people in my house. I kind of have a thing about it. 
Well, you have an idol. We already talked about that. Commandment number two. Your tools, would you give something away? Your bank account, that's his bank account. The Lord has need of it. If he has need of it, how do we, do we react like that guy? The very next thing that happens is he's using it for what he asked for. The Bible said something else there in Psalm. It said, uh, the earth and all it contains in the world and those who dwell in it. You. Forget your stuff for a second. Your money. You belong to God. And some people steal themselves from the Lord. Jonah tried to do this. And you know what happened? God came and got him. Go to Nineveh and cry against it. Their wickedness has come up before me. You're mine. This is what I'm calling you to do, where I'm calling you to go, what I'm calling you to say. Now go say it. Go do it. Get there. He gets on a boat and heads the opposite direction. The Lord, the Bible says, hurled a storm on the sea and brought him back. You know why he has a right to do that without being a wicked, angry God? Because Jonah's his, and he was stealing from God. People are stealing themselves from the service of the Lord all the time. The Bible says in Job chapter 33, verse 4, the Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. You know why you're sitting here? Because he gives you life. You know who gets the glory for you walking in the door and sitting down and getting up and walking out and breathing without problems? God gives you. He made you. You belong to him. And when we hijack ourselves, our lives, our giftings for selfish gain or laziness or ungodliness or sin of every kind, we steal and we are thieves from the Lord. We belong to him. He made us. He saved us. The Bible says we were purchased with precious blood from a lamb without blemish or spot. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. You can steal yourself from God, and that's what a thief does. You know what else we take? Sure, we take things from people maybe. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. Last thing, we steal God's glory, and that's horrifying. Glory, the Bible says, belongs to him alone, not even a little bit to you. Like, that's what Satan did. I want to ascend to the heights. I want to be like the most high. What's he saying? I want a piece of the glory. I want a piece of the worship. I want the accolades. I want the praise. I want the power. That's his. To desire that, to lust for that in your heart, is the lustings of a thief of God's glory. He says, I share my glory with no man. I am the Lord, Isaiah said, and there is no other. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, there is a song in heaven. I hope it's true of us now, but it will be true one day of every man. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. Who's worthy? Our Lord and our God to receive glory, honor, and power. That belongs to him, and we should never dare touch it. Well, I just want the respect I deserve. I want the honor. I see these people getting honored. I see these guys getting promotions. I see these people getting all the praise. People don't know what I do. People don't know what I've accomplished. People don't know how hard I work. I want musings of a thief. You have everything you have. You've done everything you've done because of him, and he should get the glory. My youngest child, Joel, my second daughter, last of the five, I think last. Stinking better be. <clears throat> She was born, as many of you know, in our home. Four of our five kids are born in our house. Not saying you have to do that. We're just weird people that do things like that. We did that, and we um, 
thought we had an assumed assumption of the progression of Aaron's labors. We've seen four now. We thought we were experts at this. You know, it's like when this happens, this happens. It usually takes this much time, and we know how to, like, predict it as best we can. So when the beginning, very beginning phases of labor with Joel happened, we notified the midwife that would often come to the house and help with the birth of the child in a safe uh, way with much knowledge that she had. So we said, hey, the baby's coming in a little while. We're probably at this phase. It's probably going to be this long. We just want to let you know this, that, and the other. Uh, about 45 minutes later, Joel was in the world, and the midwife wasn't even at our house. Aaron yelled for me to come upstairs. I was, outside, I was about to walk outside and play kickball with my kids. And she, she said, you know, she yelled my name and I ran upstairs and she said, the baby's coming right now. And I said, what? <laughs> what? Alas! <laughs> what shall we do? Well, don't. Like, it's coming. There's nothing I can do. It doesn't work like that. The baby's coming. She's not here. I'm telling you, it's happening. Get my phone. Text her. Tell her. I don't know. But here comes the baby. I'm like, now, it's funny now. <laughs> These are those moments in your life when you realize you're nothing. You ever had that? You're nothing. You go to God in a real way. What do I mean by, what do you mean a real way? I'm not saying it's not real in prayer meetings and small groups and these kinds of things. Sure it is. But sometimes we have the ability to compose ourselves and think it through. And, oh, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I think of thy scripture and thy holy writ as it is stated by the prophets that have gone afore. It, it doesn't work. God in heaven, please help me. Peter said, and he was sinking in the water, Lord, save me. And sometimes those are the best. That comes from the core of who you are. That reveals what you really believe. And I prayed to God, God, come here and do this because I realize how small we are. And she came into the world and she barely cried to where we were like, <laughs> like eh. I'm like, okay, it's, it's good, I guess. I mean, it's baby's here you know and midwife wasn't she's there and Aaron's holding the baby she's like you think she's okay I'm like I think she's okay are you okay like it's like, like all this happens so she comes and Aaron said what is her name and we had been talking about some things and I said it's Joel and nobody ever really gets that right we're not mad about it we were new and it's jo is it Jolie no it's not Jolie is it Joel isn't that a boy's name yes it is that's why it's not her name <laughs> uh, it's a, it's, it's a, Joel and Aaron knew what she's like. I, I said, do you agree? She said, absolutely. The name means Jehovah is God. Because that day, more than maybe any other, I realized that he was God and we were not. People say to us, oh, you guys are so awesome. How'd you do that? Oh, when I reference her for the rest, why, Dad, Mom, why did you name me this? Because we want you to know that Jehovah was God from the day you were born. He came in and put his hand and touched a situation we had zero control over. And he is God and we are not. You know who gets the glory? We are not awesome. He is awesome. He gets the glory. He is worthy of praise. He is worthy of honor and power. And I don't want to steal that. <laughs> glory to his name. Everything we have, the breath to speak, the breath to preach, this ministry, people say, oh my word, I don't know what you're doing. You know what we're doing? Getting out of his way and saying, he is God and we are not. Behold his power. We don't want to steal his glory and say, we figured out a human secret potion. We gave it everything we had and it rendered nothing. And then we backed off and said, God, if you don't do this, it's never going to happen. And he touches it with his sovereign, mighty hand. And it is to his glory that we have seen what we've seen. Don't be a thief of his glory. Everything you are, everything you have, every blessing, every, everything you've ever accomplished, Jehovah is God and we are not. Do not steal. Let's bow for prayer this morning. 
We have people standing by if you need prayer. Love you to approach them. Could you pray for me? Could you pray for me? Could you lift me up in this way? We'd be honored. Heavenly Father, seems appropriate to give you glory this morning. We praise your name. We lift you high. We say that you are God and we are not, but you have redeemed us. You have saved us. You have rescued us out of the miry pit, set our feet upon a rock. I pray in areas of our hearts and our lives from each other and from you, if, we have, if the Holy Spirit and the word of God has found us to be thieves, we would repent immediately. We would be a true Christ follower that can be trusted I can be honest, that gives you the praise that belongs to you, that we treat each other the way Christ followers are called to treat each other. Deliver thieves today, God. Nail it to the cross, redeem us, confront us and encourage us in Jesus' name, amen. Have a good day, everyone.